uh, a beam exchange webinar. I'm Mike Albu, I'm, I look after the beam exchange, which is a platform for sharing information and knowledge about market systems development. And we offer these, web these spaces, these grab the mic events for practitioners primarily to talk about their experiences. So if you represent an organization that would like to be here doing the talking, please let us know because we're always interested in, in people submitting proposals for webinars. But um, yes, today we have uh, Salamatu Sunzwang and Benga Ario from Propcom Mycafi, a program in northern, northeastern northern Nigeria. And they're going to be talking about rebuilding markets with unconventional partners. So um, Salamatu is uh, she's several years of business and program management experience in the private development sector in the private sector development world. And she's passionate about improving the livelihoods of vulnerable people, and uh, particularly in the conflict-stricken areas of sort of northeastern Nigeria. And uh, she's the lead for Propcom Mycafi on their poultry production and marketing efforts, which is what she's going to be talking about. And then she will be followed by Benga Ario, who's the, the lead for Propcom on animal health. And he's also had many years, ten, over 10 years experience of working with private sector development in Nigeria and uh, using the market systems approach. So um, they're going to talk for about 30 minutes. And when they're finished, we will have space for questions and answers. So just to let you know, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box, which is you should be able to see an icon down the bottom somewhere which says Q&A. Click on that and you can enter your question there. And then we'll try and get through those questions in the second half of the webinar. All right, I think that's probably enough. We've got a, a really healthy attendance now, um, Salamatu, for you. So please take it away. Thank you very much, Mike. And good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to Propcom Maker if it's the Semination Webinar, hosted by BIM Exchange. Today, Benga and I will be taking, will be sharing Propcom Maker of his experiences on rebuilding fragile markets in Northeast Nigeria. Allow me quickly take you through the outline for today's presentation. I will be discussing briefly about Propcom and then move on to discuss the peculiarities of the Northeast I will also be discussing the determinants of market access and how to improve access through unconventional channels. We will move on to how to identify unconventional partners and then take two case studies. The first case study will showcase how Propcom Maker if you adopted the community-based organization model to develop the poultry market, while the second case study <coughs> will showcase how we leverage existing, ex existing um, networks to expand access. Propcom Maker Fee is a market system development program that is funded by the UK Aid. The program works along various agricultural value chains to improve the livelihood of rural poor. It's currently in the final year of a three-year extension that started in 2018 and will run through to the end of 2021. And the first phase of the program is saw intervention being implemented across 19 northern states. However, in this extension phase, this has been streamlined to only nine states. That is six northeastern states and Kanu, Kaduna, and Jigawa. The objective of the program in this extension phase includes helping farmers build resilience against the effect of climate change, continuing to embed people living with disability and women economic empowerment across our interventions, facilitating inclusive growth in rural and agricultural markets to address vulnerability and poverty, and facilitating economic recovery to improve the livelihood of rural poor farmers in Northeast Nigeria. Most of the interventions that are currently being implemented in this extension phase are categorized under six broad markets, that is agricultural inputs, livestock and animal health, offtake, climate smart agriculture, access to finance and agricultural mechanization. As I mentioned during the introduction, I said um, in, the, in this extension phase, most of the work that we're doing, most of our activities are focused in the Northeast. 
uh, to guide or to help us understand this region or the market in this region, I'd like to share some of the peculiarities in this region. This is a region that has been in conflict for over 12 years. Sources of the conflict in this region range from armed banditry, Boko Haram, like we all know, we have issues of farmers' headaches, um, clashes. We also have ethnic clashes. This protracted period of insecurity has resulted in a heightened level of instability and humanitarian crisis in this region. Statistics have it that about 2.9 million people in this region are currently internally displaced. A direct fallout of this protracted period of conflict is limited access to land. Most people have had to flee their communities where they are to other communities. It is common knowledge that most of the people in the Northeast are farmers. And because they've had to move from their communities to other communities, it means that they no longer have access to their farmlands. If they do not have access to their farmland, this simply means that they can no longer um, carry out farming activities. If they're unable to carry out farming activities, it means there's a decrease in production and that threatens food security and livelihood. Statistics also have it that about 3.4 million persons in this region face acute hunger. Another direct fallout of the conflict in this region is limited infrastructure. Because of the conflict in this region, a lot of the infrastructure in this region have either been destroyed or are inaccessible. People are unable to gather and carry out traditional buying and selling. The markets no longer exist. Where they exist, they are either restricted with a lot of rent seeking. And this has disrupted the flow of uh, goods and services. In some areas, uh, we know that road networks have been cut off as a result of this conflict. Uh, we hear of um, people being unable to access particular roads uh, as a result of the conflict. and. Um, having to wait for the military to get, to grant access at a particular time. This whole conflict has um, disrupted demand and supply chain and limited access to market. Re-engaging, uh, we, re we realized that to re-engage the market, uh, we needed to address the constraint or to rebuild the market, we needed to address the constraint that had to do with market access. But how do we address this constraint? To be able to do this, we need to understand what determines market access? And from the cost of working in the region, we realized that disposable income was a determinant that determined you know, how much um, people are able to access in the market, how much they're able to play in the market, what they're able to get. They also needed to have access to information. They need to know, um, they need to know, uh, they have, need to have information about availability, where the product is, when is it available, the prices. So they need that information and need to know how these products and when they're available. The suppliers also need to have an understanding of the market. And then with the understanding of the market, we expect that they're able to develop the right product for the market. However, all these are underpinned by the availability of infrastructure and security. These two items um, determine how much with the private sector or anyone will be willing or will have an incentive to play in this market. And working in that space, we found out that most of the people in the region were dependent on humanitarian um, aids, um, cash transfers, and the infrastructure to re-engage the market were stretched. And it brought us, and we started thinking, how do we work in this space? How do we re-engage the market given the thin infrastructure that was on ground and the security situation? And as a program, we started looking at the, 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 the structures that were existing that were still standing in spite of this conflict. And we, we realized that there were three groups that were still um, existing um, despite the conflict in the region. We noticed that we had community-based organizations who were part of the community and had to rise up to the challenge in the times of conflict. They had to mobilize amongst themselves and provide some form of support for community members who needed them. We also realized that faith-based organizations were still functioning, were a very religious uh, group 
in this part of the country, when people are faced with challenges, they look up to God. And like the popular say that religion is the opium of the people. It's, you know, it's a good saying here. It's, it's, it's very practical here. So we realized that people were running to the religious leaders for help. And we also realized that there were individual entrepreneurial farmers who um, needed inputs for themselves and had to look for alternatives to get this input. And because they were able to get inputs for themselves, other members of the community started engaging them for the same help. And they stepped up to become individual entrepreneurial farmers. But the interesting thing about this group of people is that they're, they're well grounded you know, in their communities. They have a strong grassroots network, they're great mobilizers, their cost of operation is low in comparison to other large organizations. And they are very enthusiastic about rebuilding their communities because they're members of the communities. And then they seek financial sustainability because most of them do not have a sustainable source of income. And so we thought that to re-engage this, to re-engage the market, to rebuild the market, you know, these were the right sets of people to work with. But it brought us again to another question to say, how do we identify these people? In my current intervention where I work poultry, the traditional way I, I would engage a partner is to put out an RFQ and then assess and evaluate the responses I get and then engage the partners. However, this process excludes the grassroots. It excludes the, 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 the grassroots organizations in this um, region. And then um, it's, it's a major drawback. We also, so it brought, us to, it brought us to think and we started thinking, how do we um, solve this issue? Because uh, from experience, um, using this traditional method, we had engaged a, an organization that was good on paper. They, they ticked all the boxes. They looked like they were going to be able to, do, to deliver. And then when it was time and we engaged them to implement the intervention we wanted, which was poultry, they were unable to deliver simply because they didn't have that grassroots um, presence that was required. Yes, in some, other, uh, in some other areas, they will be able to deliver. But for that, for that we wanted to do in the communities they were unable to deliver. So we started thinking, so how do we do this? How, how do we engage on unconventional partners? And like I mentioned earlier, we, we had identified a group, but how do you select the one that is best suited for you? So what we, what we came up with in the course of work was that we carried out a mapping of um, the existing structures that were there. And then we, had, we did a headhunt for which of the organization was most suitable for what we wanted to do. And then we carried out a capacity assessment um, for, to find out the capacity of these organizations, and then we engage them. But a drawback of, um, in this process is that usually from experience, we, we realize that they usually do not have the capacity and organizational structure to be able to deliver, and you will need to invest in that. However, the, the, the driver or the good thing about this set of people is that they are very enthusiastic and they have a huge appetite for financial sustainability, and this keeps them going. Uh, for poultry work, I would like to share with you how we engaged um, the CBO, which, which is one of the unconventional partners that we had identified in um, Gombe State. The choice of Gombe State was uh, because it was in neighboring states to the conflict areas, and we had a lot of internet displaced persons move from uh, Borno and um, Adamawa into Gombe State, and it, it's a huge internet displaced, um, it's a huge host community for internally displaced persons. So we identified a community-based organization in that area called OSCD to carry out the, uh, the poultry intervention that we wanted to use in re-engaging the market. We, we thought that the poultry was a viable tool to do that uh, for so many um, reasons. It was easy to do. It was, um, you needed very little capital to do that. So, but for this to happen, there were a lot of, um, or there were three main um, success factors that were required to be able to deliver on this. They had to be the right skills. They had to have the right skill set. Um, they needed to have access to input and they also needed to have access to market. 
But what we found on ground at that time was that there were no, there were no standard delivery channels for extension service um, delivery. The middlemen and intermediary, they were having a field there as they controlled that space. And um, it made it uh, difficult for farmers to get inputs. And then the market and infrastructure, there was a, there, there was a deficit and there was no distribution channels. And this, um, this was you know, an issue. That, that was the situation on ground. But what did we do? So we went on to, we went on to invest in capacity building for OSCD. We built the capacity, we, we carried out trainings for the, for the staff members and taught them very simple seven techniques that um, they could you know, um, build farmers capacity on. We taught them to um, choose a selection of a good breed, uh, provide a, um, housing for poultry, adequate uh, supplementary feeding, vaccination, weaning, brooding, and um, record keeping, as, as well as candling. These simple techniques were able to help farmers increase their production cycles from three annually to about seven. We also supported the CBOs and by facilitating linkage to vaccine manufacturers and other major distributors around them. We also supported the CBOs to activate community vaccinators who went, who were the last mile um, delivery agents, who went into the communities to vaccinate uh, birds after the CBOs may have um, built the capacity of the women and uh, these community-based vaccinators provided the service to the women for a small fee. And the CBOs also um, ensured that this community-based, um, the CBOs ensured that the community-based vaccinators had vaccines available. So what were the outcome of what we did? We, re uh, um, we realized all, uh, part of the effect that of what we did was that farmers had increased income. Farmers uh, were able to increase the cycles of production from three to six annually. Vaccines were now available. Vaccines, um, most but before now, um, a lot of farmers lost their birds to Newcastle disease, which was the major cause of mortality amongst poultry in the North, but the vaccines were re re readily available. We also, uh, um, uh, the part of the outcome was that um, micro entrepreneurs were developed in form of the community um, vaccinators who were vaccinating for a fee. So they, they became micro entrepreneurs in the community and they were doing other things. CBOs also became quasi um, vaccine distributors. They stocked vaccines, which they supplied to community vaccinators. And as a result of that, the CBOs had increased income. So they were able to make income from selling vaccines to community vaccinators. They were also able to make income from aggregating birds that had matured, that were matured from the farmers to supply to retail stores, hotels, and other processors who required poultry. So as a result of our um, collaboration or partnership with, the, with CBOs in the Northeast, we have been able to build the resilience of 245,000 women over 220,000 women have increased income. Over 2,250 community vaccinators have been trained. Those are micro entrepreneurs, if you remember. And then we have been able to work with three CBOs. At this point, I would like to hand you over to Benga, who will take you through how we leveraged existing network to expand access. Over to you, Benga. Uh, thank you, Salamat. Um, I'll be talking to us about how a veterinary company leverage uh, individual entrepreneurs in, um, through our linkage to expand vaccine access in communities with a fragile market. This is a Pastor Polion. Pastor Polion is a, is a farmer, and uh, uh, apart from being a, a farmer, he's also a, a, a religious uh, person who stays in a in, 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 who lives in Gombe State. He, in our previous uh, intervention, uh, before the insurgency, 
he was uh, trained uh, to become a village uh, promoter, uh, a fertilizer village promoter, if I may say, who um, was involved in selling fertilizers to other farmers like himself those times before the insurgency. So he was a well-trusted hand then. So as PM Focus shifted uh, to using a market system development in the Northeast, um, we decided that our partners in poultry and the livestock market could actually leverage um, a, our partners in, in the poultry and livestock market could live, leverage this network of uh, individuals to help them rebuild the uh, rebuild fragile market in the Northeast. So what did we actually do? One of the first thing we did was that uh, we linked the Agri, Agri Project Concept International uh, with Polion during one of, our, one of the company's uh, sensitization and vaccination campaign in Bombay State. Agri Project Concept is a pharmaceutical company in Cardinal State that adopted the vaccinator model in establishing rural access using the thermostable uh, Newcastle vaccine. And um, Pastor um, Polion, and as you may know, uh, the vac Newcastle vaccine is quite an essential one in, in combating Newcastle disease in indigenous beds. So um, Pastor Bol Polion to ACI and others like him became a bridge to agri-project concept, to accessing the rural market in the in Northeast that experienced uh, insurgency. And so again, having trained, um, having done, done this, ACI trained Pastor Polion and others and, and linked them up with their distributors across um, around Gombe State so that this, um, so that Pastor Polion can be buying vaccines from, um, from these distributors. And so because he has trained um, several vaccinators over time, Pastor Polion is now a, a quasi-vaccine distributor in that he, he himself distributes vaccines among other people that he has uh, vaccinators that he has been able to train. So one thing we must note is that um, because of these activities of uh, Pastor Polion, it has become a bridge that has enabled rural vaccine to rural accesses to, to vaccine. And then in so doing, Pastor Polion with, uh, with the other uh, vaccinators that he has trained over time, also they, uh, they, they've utilized over 250,000 doses of the Newcastle vaccine. And then, he, as I said earlier, he has trained 74 vaccinators under him so that he can be uh, providing uh, vaccines, selling vaccines to them too. And over time, they've generated revenue worth over 2.5 million naira, which is uh, 4,500 pounds. And, um, and this is just within activities they have been doing over time. So however, one thing that we must note is that um, it is not only Pastor Polion that is available outside there. There are lots of um, entrepreneurs that, um, that over time that other interventions in PROCOM have been leveraging on. So one thing we can say is that um, we can, there are instances whereby seed promoters are now um, in, who are also entrepreneurial individuals in communities. Um, they are now uh, doubling as either vaccinator we have seen situations whereby vaccinators are also, uh, other interventions are leveraged on the network of vaccinators to also double as uh, spray service providers. And we've also seen situations where spray uh, service providers are also um, uh, doubling as seed promoter. In fact, recently um, we have uh, farmers that are who, are, who are entrepreneurial individuals too, are also working as uh, compost sellers to other farmers. So, um, so it is quite important for, for this individual. And one thing for them is that the key uh, major motivation for, for them is majorly around the revenue stream. Because once an individual who is uh, engaged in certain activity, um, which is making money for him or her, have other opportunities in these locations. They have other opportunity to increase their revenue income 
the 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 the, the lock onto that and then leverage on that and start making uh, extra income for themselves. And that thing for these people around this area is the social motivation. They have the urge to actually do more for their communities. And um, in so doing, they have that, um, the, 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 the communities where they reside or the communities around where they reside, they sort of give them that regard and respect them so much. And so, and because of the trust that they built over time, they can easily access different things and then other organizations can access this type of individual to actually access this type of communities. For now, what I will do is now, one of them, I will allow my co-presenter and uh, Salama to go on again on some of the key lessons that we've learned with the use of these various non-conventional MSD uh, partners. Thank you. Thank you, Benga. So I'm sure that most of the participants here today want to um, learn a few things about how we engage in unconventional markets. So I will be sharing a few of the key notes. Um, I won't call them lessons. They're, they're things to note when engaging in, um, in uh, fragile markets. Um, one of the key lessons is that um, for post-conflict, mo most times post-conflict, um, uh, is usually an illusion. When we went to work in the Northeast, we thought we we're going to post-conflict economic recovery, but when we got there, we realized that the region was still in conflict. So sometimes um, you, you go prepared for post-conflict economic um, recovery, and then you find something that is different. So your ability to adapt is um, necessary. Uh, you will also, a, a major thing to ride on um, while engaging on conventional partners in, in fragile markets is their social motivation and their desire to remain financially stable. It's, 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 it's a big brain that, that um, it could be leveraged. And then um, strengthening grassroots um, network um, has great potential for long-term development in fragile markets. Uh, we also know that um, uh, I can say that we have, in the course of our work, we have been able to strengthen the capacity of a few organizations, and they have become really very interesting for other donor organizations to work with. So it, it, it's, it, it's a great potential. We also know that uh, the private sector will do business with anyone, that um, once there's a common interest for business transaction, the businesses would take place. So those are things that we should look at um, if um, the, you know, engage in the private sector to see that, look, it, it, this makes business sense. They, they are, they're happy to engage once the, it makes sense to their business sense to them. And you know, there's a common interest for business transaction. And uh, uh, ultimately, I, I, will, I keep saying this, um, anyway, I, I get to speak, there's a risk of frustrating market recovery efforts by development partners as a result of limited coordination. I think I would like to stop here now and take questions. Thank you Over very to much. Mike. Yeah, well, thank you, Salam. Thank you, Benga. That's really very interesting and very grounded in the kind of real world of working in, in Northeast Nigeria. I think people really appreciate. Uh, it's, it's interesting. It struck me that a lot of uh, working with what, what we what we have called unconventional partners in a way sounds like a lot of what uh, donors often used to do and still do in terms of live what they call livelihoods programming working with uh, local CBO civil you know civil society organizations CBOs and so I'm quite curious about the the difference or the contrast between what you're doing now and what was done you know conventionally by donors working with local local civil society organizations and I think the crux of the the crux of that question is about sustainability and in yeah. fact uh, we have a colleague from, from Uganda Johnson who asked that question you know what what is it that you're doing that leave that, that will create sustainability in these systems that you're creating so, so for most of the times, like I, I had mentioned during my presentation, we realize that they do not have the capacity. So we build the capacity. And because we 
um, you had said um, um, livelihood programs had always used CBOs, but they had used them in humanitarian context. But this is engaging unconventional partners in a market system development context. So it's in a way that everyone, it, the sustainable part is that everyone is making you know, some form of income from it and it's sustainable. So the difference actually is the market system development, we've had to build the capacity to be able to do what we want to do. Uh, before now, we say, oh, um, donors will naturally say, I would like to, for example, distribute um, without um, being respectful, I'd like to distribute mosquito nets. And yes, they're there, they, they distribute, but here we teach them you know, how to engage in the market, to build the capacity in that region. So they are able to continue um, um, generating revenues and income for themselves. Like I said, that they hunger for financial sustainability and that's, the, that's what we, we, we build on. So that's, that's the major difference. I, I hope I answered you. I think, I think you probably, yeah, I think you did answer it very well. And I think this is really the interesting question. Um, let me just follow up with another question from Johnson in Uganda as well, um, since uh, he asked too. And thank you, by the way, for Johnson and anyone else who has questions, please get them in. Um, he, he said, still on this subject of sustainability, what linkages or connections did you build with the government in all of this? Is, is that an important, are they an important partner in the sustainability um, agenda? Of course. Of course, um, all stakeholders are important, um, depending on um, how you want to engage. You know that um, particularly in the um, context of a fragile region, the government has an important role to play. They have the role to, uh, of ensuring that there's at least some form of um, security for whoever wants to invest. And then for us, um, while engaging at the market, yes, we engaged the government in terms of policy. We had to engage them to develop um, some policy trust that we allow the private sector engage in this area as well as um, other stakeholders that were um, other relevant stakeholders. I will give an example with, um, I think, um, the community um, vaccination program. Of course, um, the government, um, the institution that provided the vaccines is government, and we had to work with them in that phase. And then we worked with them to also build or drive the networks for vaccine distribution, you know, to get to get it to a reasonable um, level before the community-based organizations could even access. So yes, engagement was all round. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, Benga, maybe thinking about your example of, of this pasta, would you say, there's a question from Susanta Sahar, who's saying, <laughs> uh, were these organizations kind of commercially orientated or was it a mixture of social and commercial incentives? So what is it, what is the motivation for people to be involved in these kinds of activities? Um, thank you for that question, Mike. Uh, so for, for sure, one of the major motivation for these guys is the opportunity to have alternative um, stream of income. And for them to, they also have the opportunity of doing something for their community that is just either maybe still in the either still in the um, in the in the um, insurgency still within the insurgency period or at the recovery mode. So a uh, recovery recovery period. So it is very essential for them because. They can provide for themselves. Another thing is a self is also motivation for them too. Thank you. Um, so I don't know which of you is best placed to answer this next question, but Kathy Siri, um, I hope I pronounced your surname right there, Kathy, asked an interesting question. She said, in working with these unconventional partners, how receptive was um, UK aid, uh, FCDO, to this approach? How long did it take? These, un these, these new partners to become familiar with and capable of managing the types of um, intervention that you were doing with them. Okay, um, I'm unable to give a, a particular time frame, but um, like I mentioned earlier, that um, in working with the unconventional partners, but part of the things that we did was to build the capacity, getting familiar with um, 
UK um, AIDS um, processes. Um, yet is part of the component that we build the capacity in. Um, we have a, a whole team that we work with, and um, the, the, there is a team that does that and builds the capacity in a way that they're able to understand how how to um, implement um, um, according to the, 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 the donors, um, what uh, should I say, um, I'm looking for that word, but to implement in the way that um, is acceptable to, to the donor and the fund that that's um, UK aid. So um, conservatively, I will say that the learning never ended. It was uh, a, a whole process that had hand holding for all the time that we we're engaged. We kept assessing and reassessing and then building the capacities and areas where we found gap. So as for as long as we're working together, the learning continued for them. Mm. Could you could you say a little bit more perhaps about the, the back? You mentioned it in your presentation, but I know that this work did not come out of the sort of blue sky out of, out of thin air. It came out of quite a long um, engagement by PropCom and Mike Harfey and previously PropCom in this area. So could you just give us a little bit of an, an insight into what the kind of what kind of activities previously, what the history was that enabled some of these successes now in this phase? Can you give us a sense of the, the history of the programme? I don't quite get your question. You want me well, to give you a uh, history so, of... Kevin, Kevin Billing has asked, the he said, you know, for example, um, what had been done already around, for example, the successful development of village-based vaccinators that enabled the, the current phase to be more successful. So we're try I'm trying to put the, the current the results okay. you got in this phase in the context of previous activities that the program okay. had undertaken. Okay, so so um, his question was saying, what did what did we do differently with the um, village based vaccinators that um, enabled them to be successful? Am I right? Something, yes, Good. I think so. Okay, so <laughs> so for the village based vaccination, it was a the intervention was a, 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 a it was a it was along the to say the whole value chain. So we started um, with working with the vaccine manufacturers um, who we had to um, discuss with uh, before now, uh, the vaccine manufacturers produced the vaccines in large vials, which um, were too much for community use. I think the um, vaccine vials came in 200 doses and um, that was resulting in wastages. And um, um, in some um, cases, the farmers couldn't afford that. So we worked with manufacturers to begin to produce um, the vaccines in small doses of 50 vials. Um, that was a hurdle we had to cross. And then we worked with the manufacturers also to build a network of distribution, the um, peri-urban dis uh, distributors. We got the outstations working where uh, businesses could go and um, easily pick up their vaccines. And then we came down to last mile delivery. We had gotten the vaccines from manufacturers. We had gotten it to a comfortable level at um, the peri-urban um, distributors. But last mile delivery was the issue. And that's where we did most of the work with the CBOs. So we built the capacity of the CBOs on how to even um, engage, you know, uh, the, the, you need to be able to um, get the right crop of people to be activated as community vaccinators. So we trained them on how to identify this crop of people, the things to look out for, and then we worked to teach the community vaccinators. We trained them to be able to train community vaccinators on the vaccination process, and then helped to strengthen the link between the CBOs and the vaccine, the, the distri vaccine distributors. They didn't have to go all the way to the manufacturers. There were distributors close to them in wherever, whatever region they were in, and then continued to support them to support the community vaccinators who were vaccinating for a fee. And in the process, we, we helped um, it was, it was a very interesting one because it was um, uh, multifaceted. And we, we, we started out to vaccinate uh, just uh, village poultry in the community. However, through the community vaccinators, some other manufacturers were also able to continue pushing other um, veterinary pharmaceutical um, um, 
um, products, you know, so, so the, like, like I mentioned earlier, the community vaccinators became um, distributors, micro entrepreneurs, they were distributing not just vaccines and um, many other things. And then they also served as um, a source for information gathering. It was very interesting for the government because, you know, they could also, um, we know that, um, that we have veterinary uh, vets, but they could also gather information back you know, to um, vet supervisors who oversaw them or community-based animal workers. That's another um, work that we did, another policy work that we did. And we're able to do some disease monitoring and surveillance. So that's, that's what we did. We invested in building their capacity. Uh, Mike, if I may add Please, to that. Yeah, I thought, I thought we'd lost you there for a minute, but you're back, so that's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if I may add to that, one thing that we must also note is that you saw, you see the, the, the use of the thermotolerant vaccine by the community vaccinators was just like a vehicle of, of reaching the rural farmers. One thing we note in PropCon was that most of the, two thirds of the animal, of the, of the poultry, of, of birds are held in the rural communities. And these are indigenous birds. And again, um, there is no house that you visit in the rural community that you will not find these birds. And so, and the major disease affecting, uh, affecting these birds. Can you hear me, please? Yeah, yeah, we're hearing you. Okay, yeah, so, um, and the major disease affecting these birds is the Newcastle, is the Newcastle disease which um, they are quite, the, these indigenous birds are quite resistant to most of the other diseases. So bird Newcastle disease is the major disease that is affecting them. And each household may be having up to like 20, 30, 40. And in a village of about 100 houses, and you have these numbers of, of birds, and you have a, a community vaccinator in that particular location, is a big money for the community and my local to actually do. And how much is it they vaccinate? It's just 20 naira per bird. And in so doing, by the time a community vaccinator vaccinates every three months, because you need every three months to actually vaccinate these birds, you vaccinate these birds every three months, you can, I, you, can, you can imagine the amount of money that comes into the hand of the community vaccinator. And you can imagine Newcastle disease takes over, as in can kill over 100% of the birds if it's, if it comes into, in, in, into a community. So the farmers are eager to protect their, 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 uh, this, this chicken. And so the community and my worker make money from this. Uh, not the community and my worker, rather the community vaccinators, they make money from this. And in so doing, this itself is, makes it very much sustainable and then makes, it, makes the community vaccinator a bridge for veterinary company to actually come in, into into um, into the community to, to to actually provide other 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 products in those sort of community. Thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, we talk about market systems. I think you, you've given us very clear illustration of why we talk about these things as systems. There are so many different actors and, and stakeholders involved and the way they interact and support and feedback information and resources amongst each other is really crucial to the success. Um, one, one factor in, in systems is finance, of course, and there's a question from uh, Javier Lacache La about whether you did any work in, with financial service providers and whether that was part of the equation in this program. You're muted, Salamati. Sorry about that. Yeah, so we did some work um, in the areas of access to finance. Um, we realized that um, farmers, farmers um, had issues accessing finance and um, uh, they couldn't, even though there were small banks that were there um, for, for uh, that was particularly supposed to target um, smallholder farmers, farmers were still unable to access finance. And when, what we did was to, you know, look at the whole system and see 
what it was that was uh, the, the hurdle that was um, disrupting or that was stopping farmers from accessing the finance. And we realized that for most banks, it was the way they profiled the farmers and um, the, 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 um, there's, uh, there's an um, equity contribution down here. I don't know how it is over there, but down here, farmers were required to give some form of equity contribution for, for most loans, not just farmers, for most loans, you um, had to give equity uh, contribution, of, I think of about 30%. And that was usually, most of the times it was too much for the farmers um, to repay. Uh, we also know that um, the repayment periods were, was an issue for most farmers because we know how agricultural products were and farmers were required to pay, you know, at a particular, um, in, in a particular manner. However, we, we, we went on to um, facilitate linkage or, or, or to, uh, we entered discussions with financial institutions in this area to, um, to, um, to stir some um, behavioral change um, to, to, to get them to know if um, that farmers were, were able to pay the equity contribution wasn't the reason why farmers would default. It was more of um, how um, the loans were structured we are structured, so we 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 are engaged with um, financial institutions, and um, we 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 we. Do I want to use the word pilot? It was a, it was like a pilot for us to see um, if the um, equity contributions were reduced, how well farmers were uh, will be able to perform, and what um, they will be able to, and how and um, how they well they were able to repay, you know, their loans. And we realized that just by getting the banks to reduce their, their, their equity contribution, farmers were able to access, uh, more farmers were able to access finance. Um, the financial institutions were able to provide much more farmers, more farmers, the net for farmers that were accessing finance increased just by reducing that equity contribution and farmers payment has been great um, since then. So we were able to, by that pilot, we're able to prove to financial institutions that um, the equity contribution um, wasn't necessary and it was a barrier that was hindering farmers. And with that, um, um, farmers, um, the financial institutions were able to, ch um, they, they were able to change the way that their packages, their financial packages were for farmers and they structured it differently. Fantastic. That's such a that's such a good example, Salamati. Thank you. Um, so let's talk a bit more about some of these some other kinds of barriers that you that you encountered. I mean, we we started we set the scene at the beginning, or you you set the scene at the beginning of this webinar by talking about the conflict and the the, the continuing insecurity and so on. What kind of cultural or social barriers did that or dynamics did that does that throw up? in your work and, and how did you tackle that so you know what's what was particular to sort of addressing the conflict setting could you take that again okay so so the question is you know you're you're working in a in very much a conflict affected setting there's a lot of uh, presumably insecurity and distrust the question from again, this is from Johnson, who's who's living, I think, and working in northern Uganda in a similar kind of um, environment. Um, and he asked, what kind of um, what kind of cultural or social dynamics developed in the communities that are affected by conflict, which were a barrier, and how did you overcome those barriers to, to okay. the work you're doing that related particularly to the, the impact of the conflict? Okay. So, so the major, the major um, uh, barrier that uh, that existed in this region is distrust. You know, uh, because of the way they are, they are there's a there's a, a disconnect. There's a big, there's a huge gap. There's a distrust. So, building that trust, rebuilding that trust, was crucial in engaging. You know, in that market. So, all we needed to do was help uh, rebuild. You know, trust. Um, get the community to know the reason why we're here you know just generally re rebuilding trust and uh, once um, the, the trust is regained um there's access and and work is fine so um if i may add to that mike yes please hello yeah please well, go we ahead. can hear you Pinga. yeah if i may add to that mike so one thing is that, remember, we, there are certain, as we said, 
when we go to communities, we realize that there are people, there are still structures on ground. And some of these structures were actually structures that the people in the community actually trusted. And then, um, and at the same time, these are people that are actually also entrepreneurs. So it was um, quite easy for us to, um, to actually build on this, work with this, work with these trusted um, individuals or structures in the community to actually have entry into the, uh, into the community. Great, okay. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's interesting. I mean, to me, that, to me, that's the most interesting point about this whole um, presentation because you, the trust is, I, I guess what you're saying, what I'm hearing is that the, the, the issue of rebuilding trust is very much linked to working with these community organizations and faith-based organizations that people have an intrinsic trust in to begin with. And you're building on, you're leveraging that social, fab, that social capital to, to achieve these economic ends. So that's very interesting. But there, there is one question which I wanted to throw up um, or bring up to the surface. It came from uh, Gordon Freer. I'm just to see if I can quickly find it. Yeah, he, he asked a question, did you experience any, or did you encounter any organizations that you felt were not suitable partners for what you were doing? And if so, what, what reasons did you have for, for maybe distrusting them? Yes, we did. Yes, uh, we did. I'd mentioned during my presentation that uh, we had uh, a partner uh, that uh, I, I wouldn't want to call names, but uh, they were good on paper, um, but they couldn't deliver for the intervention we wanted to do. They were a women-based uh, organization. They had the numbers, but for the grassroots intervention, they couldn't deliver. I wouldn't use the word distrust, uh, but um, we were unable to work with them because they didn't have the capacity and the right um, grassroots network that we needed for the intervention we wanted to implement at or in that region. So yes, we did. And um, they couldn't deliver in terms of capacity at the grassroots level. They would have been able to deliver in some other areas, but at grassroots level, they didn't have the capacity. They lacked the business capacity uh, to do what we wanted them to do at that time. Right, okay. A um, couple of questions then. Let, let's, we only got a few minutes left, so let's try and, 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 and sort of wrap things up. There's two, two interesting questions really. One is, um, how successful were you, or, or let me just see if I can find the question. It was about taking it to wider, um, yeah, so Kevin Billing asked a question um, quite early on, which is what have you done to kind of take this, these stories, this success to other states like Gombe? I didn't get that question. How, yeah, what have you done to communicate to this, these stories, this, these examples, to communicate your success to other parts of Nigeria, to, to try and spread the word, as it were? Oh, oh well, um, this is one we're doing. Um, we've had a series of um, other dissemination webinars that are ongoing. Um, we usually have um, events like um, stakeholders review meetings. So at every opportunity, we, we get to engage uh, with stakeholders at any level. We are happy to showcase what it is that we have done. Um, we also um, carried out tr capacity transfers to CBOs. So in most areas, even when we are not there, CBOs are continue, uh, able to continue speaking about the work we have done and they're able to continue replicating what we have done. Good. And, and these, these other webinars you mentioned, are they available for people to, to watch and listen to? Yes, yes. Um, um, they, they can visit our website. Um, the recordings are there. And um, they'll be able to access them on our website. Okay. All right. Well, we'll maybe somebody can put a link, a, a link to the website in the chat box um, while we're talking. Um, no problem. Coming up shortly. <laughs> do you... Um, <laughs> So the, the other, another question really is what what prospect this, this was from Cyril Inegbedion. Ineg, apologies for mangling your name, Cyril. But what what do you think the prospects are for other donor agencies taking up this kind of approach in Nigeria? 
the prospects of taking up this kind of approach in, in Nigeria. Other, do, you, do you think other donors are, in, are showing an interest in this approach? Yes, in, in, um, in we, we, we currently have other donors, uh, donor agencies who we are partnering with that have approached us to provide technical support in, in, in very, at various levels um, for uh, most of their program implementation. So yes, um, uh, there's significant interest. And uh, because we're um, currently in the process of transferring capacity to other donor organizations, um, small businesses who uh, are interested or willing to take up this approach, um, yes, they're able to take it up and they are currently taking it up. I can say they, they, they are. We have uh, received a couple of requests uh, to support in terms of um, technical and uh, in terms of um, uh, technical content on how to implement the programs in the way we have and other private organizations too um, they're replicating what we're doing already i think um, there's a private organization um, in gumbi state um, I, I think I, um, I can go ahead and mention total is is replicating part of what we have done and we are collaborating with other ngos um, to implement the program in the way we are okay let me, so there's a great question, and I, I, this is very close to my heart as well, um, from, again, from Johnson in Uganda. How do you reconcile your approach with the emergency programs that are being implemented by uh, humanitarian agencies and government? And we, we always have this, qu this question about the, the, the intersection, the nexus between humanitarian support and, and relief and, and market development and how, how, what was your experience of this nexus and how did you manage it and do you feel you had an influence? Okay, so um, we had to do some segmentation and targeting um, on, on the way forward. Yes, um, because it was a conflict area, we had um, a lot of uh, humanitarian um, donor organizations working in that space and we were looking at ways of rebuilding the market or intervening in a way that was sustainable and of course you know th there were things that um, were conflicted but what we began to do was to we knew that uh, this, most of these organizations had um, handouts to give and but we will we started partnering with them in a way that yes, you will still give up what you're giving, but let's work together to make it um, in a sustainable manner. If um, donor organizations, for example, donor organizations wanted to give out um, birds um, to um, women in IDP host communities to help them, revive, yes, they will just give. So we thought that, okay, rather than just give them, why don't we build their capacity, whatever you're working with, uh, the capacity, so uh, the component of sustainability. So we had to begin to complement the efforts rather than work um, in, uh, in parallel ways. So we decided to complement ourselves. So we, we did a lot of partnering and we did a lot of engagement with other donor organizations and humanitarian organizations in the space. And did you find that there was a um, that people were receptive to this market systems thinking amongst in the humanitarian space? Did you find people w were easy to engage, or did they resist, or how did you how did you overcome the resistance? Maybe. Okay, well, of course there will be resistance because they 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 had they were, they were working in a particular way and um, getting them to well not change just um, work together with us in, the, in a manner that was a slightly different um, didn't sit well with some partners however um, because we all had a common goal you know to improve the livelihood of this vulnerable persons and uh, just by discussing and communicating and, at, and just engaging at that level to say look yes they still get what you want to give to them but we're teaching them how to do it in a sustainable manner so even when we pull out and we're not here, they're able to continue generating or implementing in a manner that is sustainable. So it was, we all had a common goal. We're just doing it differently. So we only just um, needed to discuss and agree. And um, it was easy for us to take it forward because we all had a common interest. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure your, uh, your eloquence also helped there, Salamatu. Um, <laughs> we've run out of time. Um, it's been a great pleasure listening to Benga and Salamatu talking about the work in Northern Nigeria. So Thank you very much.